nature walk with me. We're gonna check out some really cool trees. We're gonna hang around and talk about all those things in nature that we can't live without. Let's go get nerdy and yeah, let's get nerdy about nature. Nerdy and yeah, let's get nerdy about nature, baby. Nerdy and yeah, let's get nerdy about nature. Come on, let's get nerdy about nature. Wow. Absolute stunner of a day where I am right now. Um, you know, the forecast is calling for nothing but rain showers, and it is full bluebird here, so I love when that happens. Um, hope it's a great day wherever you are right now, tuning into this episode of the Nerdy About Nature podcast. Welcome to the show. My name is Ross, um, and I'm really stoked um, on today's episode. I've got um, a really fun, super knowledgeable guest, Tom Balfour. Um, he's a fish biologist that I work with at Redfish Restoration Society out in Euclid, BC, and he and I talked about all sorts of different issues, pertaining to anadromous fish, i.e. salmon, um, you know, all the various factors that are impacting their low population numbers, how they're impacted by habitat degradation. Um, we talked a little bit about Tom's thesis that he's working on and the work being done to re-envision the role that fish hatcheries play in supporting our remaining wild salmon runs. So for a little bit of background on this subject, um, you can tune into the last episode I did with Jessica Hutchinson. She's the executive director at Redfish Restoration Society. Um, and her and I kind of talked about the historical um, kind of happenings and impacts of different developments that has kind of created this dire situation we have um, within our watersheds and the restoration work that is going into creating healthy habitat for wild salmon. So um, just for a little background on restoration, that might be a good one to tune into. Both episodes totally work as, as standalone ones. Um, this one we're going to talk more specifically about fish. Um, but if you want to hear the forest side of things, tune into the one with Jessica. That one's really good too. Um, now, before we get into the real meat and potatoes of this podcast episode, I just want to take a quick moment here to acknowledge and address every one of you that supports me on Patreon. Because without you, you know, none of this whole nerdy about nature stuff would be possible. Uh, this is a completely independent passion project, and as such, it relies on support from folks like you. Um, so, big shout out to some of my my recent Patreon supporters here, specifically uh, Connor, Roy Shaw, Matt Kindberger, Chris Johnson, and Rochelle Lazar. You folks are awesome. Without you, none of this is possible. So if you want to become a Patreon supporter, I've got all sorts of different perks and fun things going on there. You can check it out at patreon.com slash nerdyaboutnature or find more information about this whole project at nerdyaboutnature.com. So now that we've got that all out of the way, let's jump into this conversation here with Tom. What's up, bud? Hello, Russ. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Nerdy About Nature podcast. Thanks for joining me here along this uh, lovely little creek here. You want to um, start off by just giving me a little bit of an introduction. Who are you? And what are you doing in your, with your life? <laughs> well, thanks for having me, Ross. Uh, my name's Tom Balfour. Um, I live here in Eclulet, it's sunny west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm a fish ecologist. I work mainly with redfish restoration. Um, I also do work with the Thornton Creek Salmon Enhancement Society in the Toquat Nation, just all around issues um, on salmon, salmon habitat. Mm. Yeah, and we're here on Mercantile Creek. This is Mercantile. Have you spent much time on this creek? No, no, never. This one, there's no salmon in here. There's a barrier quite close to the ocean. Oh, really? I think it might be one of Yuki's water sources. It is, for sure. Yeah. Because um, I know that there's like a little, I don't know, gated off zone down there. Okay. But I don't know what they would do there. So this isn't f fish bearing anymore? No, no. As far as I understand, there's there's a natural barrier. I don't know if it ever was salmon bearing. Oh, It's just a natural barrier quite close to the coast. And What's the barrier? I think it's just like falls or something. Oh. I, I actually don't know too much about this Interesting. system. Interesting. Yeah. Because, I mean, me not being a total fish person, I see this little creek and I'm like, God dang. If I was a fish, this would be like a pretty deluxe place to spend some time. <laughs> it is. It's lovely. And back in the day, I mean, they did a lot of that blasting out those passages and, and putting in fish ladders to get fish into right. places like this. But um, yeah. And so the Thornton Creek fish hatchery, that's just one uh, kind of tributary north of here. Yeah, exactly. And Thornton's the same thing. It's very short. Like the creek itself for the salmon bearing is less than 100 meters. Oh, really? Before it. Uh, yeah, maybe 150 meters before it hits the uh, falls that salmon can't get up. And so that's kind of the idea that that's a totally manufactured run. They transplanted fish in there. Interesting. And then um, then there's no threat of mixing with wild stocks. It's just a fake salmon run. And that's where you're doing your thesis at there? Uh, my thesis is on the Toquat River with that society in, the, okay. in that hatchery. Okay. Yeah. Um, we'll get into that in a bit here. But, oh, okay. Uh, tell me... Where are you from originally, and how did you get into fish? 
Um, so I grew up between Victoria and Vernon, BC, and back and forth with my parents in school and work, and then ended up back in Victoria at the end of my teenage years for university. Um, I wrote to fish, I guess, was a little bit indirect. Um, I've always worked in the bush. Like that started when I was 17 doing spraying um, herbicide for, for tree planters. And you that, were telling me about this yeah, the other day. And that was my sort of introduction to fish work or bush work, sorry, as a teenager. And then just kind of kept going from there. I spent some time in the mill. And then all through, I, so I went to school for biology. Both my parents were trained as biologists, and I, I thought that would kind of be the route for me, um, but not so certain on what kind of area of biology. And then all through my university days, I worked in mineral exploration for, for a contractor there, just doing all sorts of tasks related to like grassroots mineral exploration, creek sampling, soil sampling, claim staking. Um, and so I did that for probably five or six years. Was that mostly around British Columbia? or It was kind of all over. I started in the Yukon and ended up doing some work in northern BC. Um, did some time in Manitoba and none of it. And I, I even ended up in Morocco and Western Sahara at, oh, the, wow. at the end of it. Um, and yeah, so doing all this exploration work. And I was working around all these geologists who um, would t told me I would never work as a biologist. And you, you got to switch fields. And, and this is where the money's at. And mm. And I kind of took that to heart a little bit. And so half, like, I did three years of biology and then switched over to doing some more earth science-y stuff in school. Um, and yeah, I ended up with this um, physical geography, environmental science degree. Um, yeah, carried on the mining stuff a little bit. Um, moved out here and, and carried on. And then, yeah, and yeah, and then ended up with Redfish, but more, more from this like project manager um, bushwork kind of role that just sort of um, expanded and grew into the, the fish stuff, I guess. Okay, so you didn't get involved with redfish doing fish biology. That Not, just kind of happened. Yeah, no, they they, they kind of hired me to, to run projects and, and do this, yeah, more on the on just on the habitat side of things. And then that's sort of been the cool part about this whole journey with, with that organization and restoration being so interdisciplinary. I got to spend lots of time with the fish biologists they had at the time and the geologists and the foresters and sort of learning from all these different people. And from that sort of my, I've always been interested in fish and love fish, but that was sort of the route to where I first kind of saw it as a potential career path and sort of like kind of honed in on all, like being exposed to all these different aspects of the work. Um, kind of like figured out that's sort of what I wanted to do and then start of focusing my work and skills from there. And then, yeah. And then grad school is just sort of an extension of that, trying to specialize further. And right. So do you feel like, do you use like, you have quite a diverse background. I didn't realize that you did so many, so many things with mineral exploration and forestry stuff. Yeah. Do you use a lot of that in the restoration work? I mean, like you're kind of drawing from all these different experiences and knowledge sets totally and i i think at, at the start yeah i felt like i was pretty generalist um but i think in, in the field of habitat restoration that has really served me well because a lot of our work yeah like i said it's super interdisciplinary and a lot of the habitat issues are actually their geomorphology issues or their forest condition issues that um, manifest themselves in fish problems but yeah, and especially for sort of my realm of Central West Coast and the redfish now and the habitat work is very much a blend of, yeah, fish science and then the earth science piece. And so, yeah, it, it was a roundabout route, but I do think it's really helped me sort of be good at my job. Yeah. <laughs> um, we talked about it the other day, but uh, tell me again about your uh, your first foray into bush work as a kid doing spring glyphosate on second growth forests. Yeah, that was a funny one. I... It was this last, it was the summer of grade 11 and my, my parents were pretty pushing me to go to this class, this course, this certification that would help you get on the wildfire squad. Right. Is this around Vernon? Or this was this in Vernon. Yeah. So I did my high school in Vernon. I was there from when I was like 10 to 18 and a bunch of my buddies and I did this course and we met this contractor who was like, no, no, you don't want to fight fires. You want to come work for me spraying herbicide. <laughs> and and we didn't really know what it was. It just meant we got to go out in the bush. And it was, we were kind of going in a year post planting. And you'd walk around with a big jug of, it was Roundup on your back. And you'd have a little cone. You put it over the tree and spray around and sort of repeat. And we do that at cut blocks. Or we also did a lot of veg control at hydro dams and, and ski hills. Ski hills. Yeah. And so, and spent a lot of time covered in the, 
roundup. What was the uh, the PPE like at the time? I mean, I'm sure it was all above board. <laughs> like it was a legit company working, um, but we certainly got covered in Roundup. And the whole time they talked about it, it was quite safe. And sometimes they would just douse the block in Roundup while we were working. And um, <laughs> yeah, just I, in, like t-shirts and oh, shorts. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he'd have a hard hat on. Well, I mean, thank God, <laughs> yeah, just in case. Yeah, but we weren't no, no kind of like respirators or anything like that. You try and wear long sleeves, but I mean, even gloves. I think we wore gloves. I mean, we were just kind of teenagers, just right. wasn't thinking too much about Expendable. that Expendable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a long time ago now. I hope those guys were looking out for us. I remember it as a positive experience. But yeah, that was my intro to bush work. So, okay, let's bounce back to some fish here. Okay. <clears throat> Tell me about fish. <laughs> um, specifically, what are andronomous fish? Anadromous fish. Anadromous. So that is just a type of fish that will spawn in freshwater and rear in salt, as opposed to diadromous, which is the opposite, rear in freshwater, spawn in the ocean. Oh, no, that's catadromous. The whole group are diadromous fish. I'll get my terminology messed up. Oh. So, yeah, you can be a diadromous fish that either is anadromous, goes to the ocean, spawns in freshwater, goes to the ocean to rear, or you can be catadromous, spawn in the ocean, rear in freshwater. And it's like eels and stuff do that. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, but so yeah, anadromy is just going back and forth. Between and, different water systems. Yeah, between salt and fresh in one respect to the other. Right. Yeah. And that's going to be so crazy from a biological standpoint, like, because the fish are breathing this water, but salt water is much different than fresh water. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, yeah, and it's it's an, an amazing like physiological change um, that has to happen to, to make that possible, right? To be able to survive in both salt and fresh, and um, like yeah, salmon are able to transition pretty quick between the two, but it, it is um, quite an impressive and taxing undertaking to to switch over those systems. And so here, like with a lot, of, I mean, salmon are obviously like the most famous ones around here. Mm -hmm. Salmon and steelhead. Which is what we work a lot with and with redfish. Yeah. Um, tell me what, like, why, how are these fish so dependent on these freshwater systems and how have they kind of been impacted in the past? So how are they so dependent? Because um, it is that, that anadromous thing, right? The, the stream is sort of their nursery grounds. Um, so, yeah, if you don't have a place to spawn, you're mm -hmm. in trouble for the next generation. Um, and so I guess you can start when the, sa the adult salmon are returning back, you know, they've expended all their energy. They are sort of at their weakest. Um, they need high quality play. They need to be able to access habitat. And once they get there, it needs to be suitable for them to dig their reds and deposit their eggs. And they need to not get wiped out by different, all sorts of different issues along the way. Right. And then once those fish come out of the gravel, they are, again, well, even during the incubation, they are dependent on conditions in that watershed to... Right let them survive right like salmon aren't like humans where we put a lot of care into our offspring they sort of they lay as many as they can in the hope that a few survive and they sort of leave it up to the ecosystem and, and the habitat to kind of dictate how successful they are because obviously those fish won't be around to raise their young and so that's sort of their strategy try and have a lot of offspring and, and hope that conditions allow for some success there and yeah and yeah that was the first part of the question <laughs> well i mean and then the impact of that because i mean freshwater ecosystems especially pertain to like land usage and development hasn't even really been considered until maybe the last like 20 years like the late 80s they kind of started realizing like mm. the impact of like logging and road building and development on uh the hydrology of like how a slope like sheds water the quality of that water the river systems down below like this is all like relatively new in the human scape of things totally and yeah and that like fish forestry interaction stuff is is a bit more relatively recent as we sort of figured out the the cost of industrial clear cutting on these slopes but i mean we've been modifying freshwater habitats since um colonizers showed up here really and like I was reading something recently about that. They kind of figure the first steps in salmon decline were when the fur trappers came in and took out all the beaver. And like mm. that was, you know, like 1700s, 1800s. Like it sort of started from there, this kind of wide scale alteration of watersheds and watershed processes. And and then like clearing for agriculture and diking and damming and building berms and all these things 
simplified salmon habitat on a pretty large scale, especially in the States, California, Oregon, Washington, we're here. It's so much more remote. We didn't have those impacts until a bit, a little bit later. Um, but then here on the coast, it was forestry, right? That was, that's sort of the main human development on the West coast of the Island here. We don't have big farms or hydro projects. Um, and you're right about that. Those impacts weren't necessarily as considered or, or well understood when we first started kind of going full steam on the industrial logging piece. And, and then the insidious thing about that stuff too, is we enough research has shown that like those impacts can take decades to sort of materialize and then persist decades longer. Right? You don't see them necessarily instantaneously after logging or, or sort of here. And it's not necessarily a straight line between like action and effect. It's like this weird wiggly causation thing that like, it takes a lot to study it and even understand it. Like the beaver saying, like, yeah, that was not a direct in, like impact on salmon by any means. It was just, it was taking out something that modified the rivers that had mm -hmm. control over like these ecosystems and, and the way that they flow. And that like the trickle down effects of that just altered salmon habitat for however many generations of fish. Yeah. Kind of forever. Exactly. And that, that's sort of it, right? Like think of like these rivers are sort of an, um, an expression of everything that goes on in the watershed and it's all a big system like a machine right and you start pulling out pieces and yes it continues to work there's still water flowing um there's still fish coming back but you are pulling out really key pieces of these processes and the things that made the ultra abundant salmon populations that we always talk about and wish we had back um were when these watersheds were functioning at their with all their pieces right when the beavers were here when the mature forest was the whole watershed and and all these sort of things um yeah i mean with most of their pieces because even then like <clears throat> and we were talking about this in the car but like the kind of heyday that like um western kind of culture like glorifies like the early 1900s of fish runs when you're pulling out 60 pound salmon out of a, a net just mm -hmm. like jumping out of the out of the water like you know so many salmon that you could walk across the water <laughs> yeah. on their backs that type of thing like that would have been after the fur trade so even those populations were theoretically impacted by the shift in, in watersheds yeah and that, that's kind of it like we we've been having an impact on salmon returns long before we were sort of monitoring their numbers um um, just yeah, with all these shifts in land use, but that kind of shows like how resilient and tough salmon are. That yeah, despite that hundred years of colonization and development, they were still so strong that you know we we start talking about official declines, yeah, turn of the century. But when in fact, yeah, we probably we've had no idea what the numbers used to be like, and we can guess and model, but um, yeah, a lot of damage had already been done, and, and things were sort of ticking that way. Uh, and then we ramped it up really hard. <laughs> Yeah, tell me about the ramp up. Um, I can only really speak to forestry on the island and stuff. Like, um, you know, we've been destroying salmon habitat across North America in all sorts of ways. Um, but my work and, and focus has always been on the, the forestry impacts. And I guess out here in particular was a little bit later in the game. It's a little bit more remote and hard to access. You know, they had kind of cleared out all the big trees and the big river bottoms on the mainland before moving to the island but yeah so they, they sort of say like industrial scale logging was kind of late 60s 70s kind of peaking in the 80s when they were really going hard on a lot of these watersheds and that was sort of when the most aggressive kind of large scale clear cutting was happening um and that's really the problem right like the small scale local logging maybe could have been done in a way that didn't have such impacts it was really when mechanization came in and and clear cutting whole riparian forests and whole hill slopes that stuff really started to kind of come apart yeah getting, then, a, little, getting a little wet here yeah <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep pushing through okay hopefully it blows over um, and then there's been like so many other impacts how is it working in restoration and like trying to work um in rehabilitating these salmon populations when there are so many different influences so many different impacts like it's like yeah restoration and habitat is one part of it but then there's like commercial fishing sport fishing um like pollutants draining off there's fish farms there's hatcheries there yeah. are like so many different things that everybody has kind of a different opinion on how it interacts with these species and at the end of the day like whatever is more at fault than the other like all of these are issues so how do we like go about 
yeah. addressing that <laughs> or under, understanding it to begin totally. with. Totally. And that's a tough question, a bit of a depressing one. Like any people here, you talk about salmon in this like death by a thousand cuts thing, which is just what you say. And there's all sorts of different issues. But some of these cuts are deeper and worse and, and more substantial. Um, and yeah, you're right. Like, so quantifying and understanding which impact is worse is, is a very difficult thing to do. And it's, and it varies river to river, salmon population to salmon population, which ones are being affected by what. Um, but as far as freshwater habitat, like the reason I enjoy it and, and support it and work in this field is it, it does feel like something tangible that we can do right now. Like I can't have a lot of influence on ocean conditions or, or climate change or, or changing government policy for whatever it is, fish farms or, or hatchery, whatever your issue kind of is. Um, like I think there's a time and place for that and there's a lot of great groups focusing on that sort of thing. Um, but what's always sort of appealed to for me, the habitat restoration and redfish's work is this sort of concept of without pointing any fingers, um, here's an issue that we can start working on today um, without trying to make any vast changes to politics or society. Um, you know, I think most people understand that we should be taking care of the places we live and if we care about fish taking place care of the places they live and and yeah and for me it's something we can do sort of right now it's not going to solve the salmon issue um but it can certainly help and and it's something we can do today right we can put wood in a stream and fish will start using it and if that's you know was one of the limitations of that stream you know that's like a simple little victory um and then you can kind of start to do enough of those maybe maybe have a bigger impact like i can't remember it was just or someone who was, was telling me like looking at it like um if, if finances make sense to you like the, the marine world is sort of like the stock market like that's where you make your big gains and losses um but you also need a savings account which would, would be the fresh water right that you have to have a like so if you have a good year at sea and the fish all come back and they have nowhere to spawn you're not gonna be able to capitalize on those gains or same thing when you have a shitty year at, at sea um, you still need good freshwater habitat to take advantage of, of both those sort of situations. And like, yeah, maybe ocean conditions will turn around and we'll figure out our fishing. The fish farm issues will be mitigated and we'll still need freshwater habitat to sort of capitalize on this um, good, good ocean conditions. But, but yeah, it's important to not get too focused on one issue i think too like i'm not going to sit here and say that that's habitat restoration is the solution to all our problems right but it's something i'm going to keep working on and, and i see value in <clears throat> yeah and it's nice to have like tangible uh, tangible work where you can like literally see the effects happening like yeah exactly um, we did a fish swim down tranquil the other week and like being able to see it. what was it like like knowing that you had worked on installing certain uh you know log jams and then going and seeing little juvenile fish rearing in in like their shelter that's so cool and that is so satisfying and do you get like a dad kind of like, oh, <laughs> maybe and now that i am a dad i can relate to that a bit more <laughs> um yeah no it, it is really good for the soul i feel and i guess you know like i don't know if those fish were going to be there anyways and they just kind of came up to our structure but regardless they're using it they liked it um, I'm happy with that and it is rewarding. Like if we're going to spend a day building something in the river and then the fish come use it, like, oh, that's good enough for me. And, you know, like the salmon world can get depressing and there's so many, so much politics and everyone's got different opinions and it, it can be this really polarizing, complicated world. But I, that sort of simplifies it down for me and I can kind of pull back from that and mm. have our own little impacts. And, so <laughs> before we, I mean, not that we need to get into like the nitty gritty details of all <laughs> that heavy political discussion, but tell me a little bit about um, salmon, like the life cycle of a salmon. In general, salmon return kind of, they'll be out on the island here. We'll just talk about the islands. It's so diverse everywhere. But here there's the salmon will start to show up offshore and kind of late early spring and um depending where they're going start to make their way towards their natal streams um come yeah end of summer early fall the first sort of wave of fish and, and out here it's our chinook and sockeye that run first um followed pretty quickly by the chum and coho um and yeah and they'll start to make their migration the kind of cool thing about all the different salmon species sort of have their niches in terms of run timing habitat preference where they are in the river um so there's all sorts of little nuances there um 
But yeah, each sort of species will kind of find its timing and its place, and they'll either hold in the bay until the river's right, or they'll come into the river and, and hold until they kind of pick their spawning site, and then, yeah, they'll, they'll pick their, their appropriate spawning site, right? Each fish has different gravel and kind of preferences and sites, and then they, they nicely sort of partition themselves through the watershed. Um, Jess kind of talked a little bit about that on um, the previous episode oh, there. Do, yeah. do you know more about that? Like. Like, what's the difference in, like, spawning gravel that Coho looks for versus Chinook versus Sockeye? Like, yeah, a lot of it just has to do with their size and their ability to jump is sort of my take on it. So, like, Chum, for example, are big, strong fish, but they're terrible jumpers. So, in most cases, they're spawning in the very lowest reaches of a river. Um, and they don't mind spawning in the main stem. They can move big gravels. Um so yeah, so the chum will be low down and they come in in big densities that they used to. Um, and yeah, and they're, they're able to move bigger gravels. They don't mind main stem spawning. They'll, they'll use spawning channels as well, like smaller pieces. Um, Chinook also like to spawn main stem. Um, again, they're big, strong fish. They can jump better than, Chino or better than chum, so they'll go a little higher. Um, and these, the, Ch the Chinook on the West Coast are what's called stream type, so they are ocean type, sorry, where they come in in the fall and, and then hatch and then leave that following spring compared to in the interior, bigger systems. We have uh, stream type Chinook come into the river in the spring and do these massive migrations and then they'll spend a year in the river. Um, so that's kind of an important differentiation on the, on the Chinook stuff, but. But then coho are smaller fish and great jumpers, so they seem to like the upper tributaries, and they'll go far and they'll go high into the little creeks and little tribs and a little bit smaller gravel. Same with steelhead are kind of all over. Like steelhead can spawn a lot of different places. They can jump. They can move big gravel. Um, and something like a sockeye, again, yeah, they all. It, it's a variety, but sockeye can spawn on a beach in sand, or they can spawn in gravel in a river. Um, that's the other thing to, to remember too, is that like each population is different and they like, and down to tributary spawners versus main stem spawner. It's like, there's so much variety within a species too. And within these sort of different populations, um, we're like, yeah, it's in sockeye, whether you're a beach spawner or a river spawner, or you hang out in the lake or you prefer the, the river. Or, right. Yeah. That's what's, that's what's so like fascinating to me about it. Again, like I'm not somebody who's like, as studied in it as you but like yeah. just looking at it, it's like yeah we classify all these as like the same species but like each river has its own separate population its own distinct population it's like saying like we're all humans but if you took somebody from you know one part of the world and move them to the other part like immediately it's not like they could just like adapt like right away like no. there's there's different like cultures there's different languages there's different like land knowing like there's different like knowledge that you bring based on the river systems you're from totally and that then that's just it and like salmon are cool and that they are uh, really resilient and they, they you know like for the most part they're coming home to their home stream and sometimes their home gravel patch but also there's other ones that stray and that's a natural part of the system and they can go colonize a whole new stream but you're right for the most part fish are genetically adapted to their particular environment and that's what makes them so successful yes they can go colonize another watershed but it's going to take a while um, before they can become as successful as ones that are in their watershed where they've adapted for thousands of years um and yeah and that is an important piece like when you start to talk about hatchery practices and transplanting fish like it isn't as easy as salmon or salmon or salmon it's like no, oh, the salmon are from this creek and and it's and particularly important out here where we ha we don't have a lot of big rivers. There's no Fraser River, Columbia River. It's a, a series of lots and lots of small systems whose success was dictated because of their ad adaptation to all these unique habitat types. And then the amazing rearing grounds we have with Barkley and Clayquot Sounds that then they can take advantage of that all, all together, but while being uniquely adapted to all these tiny little systems. Mm -hmm. There's a difference though between the salmon you mentioned and steelhead, and you haven't said it, but I have a feeling steelhead is your fav favorite fish. If I had to pick one, yeah, I just fascinated <laughs> by them. <laughs> yeah, you talk yeah. about steelhead slightly differently. Yeah, and so, I, what's the difference? Um, just what the main difference? Why are steelheads so rad? <laughs> I actually have a king of the salmon there. 
I don't know. They're the hardest fighting, highest jumping, most long lived. Like the fact that so so steelhead are rainbow trout, same thing, the same species, who take on this um, anadromous life history and. I can't remember the exact number, but steelhead have something like 60 plus different life histories. They can take different combinations of freshwater rearing time, estuary ha- residents, um, saltwater migrations. Well, and well, Yeah, we'll expand on that term again. Life- so like a life history is just sort of the description of the different stages in us. Yeah, what's a good way to like, I mean, it's just sort of your story, right? Is your life history. But like the type of life that a fish could lead. Yeah. And should it choose to, or should it? it, Yeah. They sort of have these different options. And sort of like I was talking about with the two different types of Chinook, whether they go and spend a whole year in freshwater, um, or, or, or just, just a couple months in the spring, um, the same species, but that's a different life history they've taken or a Chinook that goes out for two years, um, is a different life history than the one that decided to go out for four years. Um, yeah, and so salmon, they're, they're limited. You know, they have quite a few, but I think it's more on the order of 10 to 20, depending on the species and where you are, where it's, yeah, still had of orders of magnitude, more variety in their life history. Whether they're, um, So that part's interesting. They, they can be repeat spawners, which is, is really cool. So to be able to do this amazing migration, you know, they have similar offshore migration to salmon, um, and they can come back and spawn, but they can then turn around and do it over again. Um, which is super impressive. Like two them. to three times in their lifetime. Yeah, if they're lucky, for sure. It's you know, it's not super common to get that, but you know, maybe it was more so when, when stocks are healthy. But yeah, no, they can certainly repeat spawn, and um, I just think that's pretty incredible. To you know, we consider salmon migration one of the greatest animal journeys out there. That they can do it again is is something um, pretty special. And then I just, like, I'm a steelhead fisherman. I like all the lore and, and history around steelhead angling in the Northwest and, and just sort of what a piece of our culture that is, steelhead and salmon angling. And, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just, I mean, I like just trout in general and the steelhead are somewhere in between. And Trouty kind of guy. Yeah, just fascinated by them. I mean, I like them all. Um, sometimes, too, there's a little bit like the salmon get all the fanfare and it, it's hard to to, I don't know, get attention to things like cutthroat trout and rainbow and steelhead. Um, so it's, yeah, a little bit of an underdog thing. Depends where you are, though, right? Well, and steelhead, like, they have the ability to adapt or have choice, like you were saying. Like the story of the Elwha, the good cut, or the <laughs> rainbow trout that were, like, sealed off by the dam, and as soon as the dam opened up. Yeah, I wish I could remember the details of that one, but it was, yeah, so big dam removal. The dam had been there a long time. It's a really cool habitat restoration project on the Olympic Peninsula where they pulled these dams out of the yeah, these historic, River. Yeah, the Elwha River, which is one of these amazing Olympic Peninsula salmon and steelhead streams. And pretty quick after the dam removal, they started seeing summer steelhead up above the dam sites. And, and that's one of the, the going theories was that those rainbows that had been trapped up there forever was still had those kind of steelhead genes in them. As soon as they were able to be free, they were free. Or they came from somewhere else. I'd have to reread the study. If I, um, but just the fact, yeah, that, that they can recolonize and you connect habitat and sort of like, yeah, these things we thought maybe we lost were sort of just sitting there dormant and and that is a cool story. Well, and the ability to like <clears throat> move based on river or sea locate or sea conditions. Yeah, and then, and the, you know that stuff's a lot harder to study, but there is definitely evidence. That, yeah, they sort of dictate their life history, maybe based on the the amount of adult returns or density of fry in the river, and kind of use that as sort of the bellwether for ocean conditions and deciding whether or not I should rear in stream or I should go to sea, and then. Um, yeah, just super adaptable fish. Yeah, and that's mind-boggling There's just a lot to me. going on, yeah. And I I don't think anyone really knows how they, they make these decisions and how, like, conscious it is or it's just all instinct. And, well, there's so much of it, too, that's, like, we're so limited by our scope of understanding, like, the way that we interpret the world around yeah. us. Like, how are we supposed to anthropomorphize a fish and assume we know what it wants based on our value set? <laughs> yeah. like, that it's sitting there making these decisions, stressing out like we do. Yeah. Like, it's like quarter-life crisis. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, ah, oh, uh, Bobby went down to the river last week. He said it was great. Maybe I should drop down. I need a change of scenery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This, place is getting old. this town is, this <laughs> pool is too small. Yeah. I know everybody. Can't yeah. go anywhere. People are always asking me about my personal life. Yeah, I'm out of here. Going <laughs> yeah. north. 
<laughs> no, absolutely. Finding it's, some uh, new uh, waters. <laughs> yeah. It is. It's such a mystery. Maybe there's someone out there who knows this stuff, but it's not me. But Steelhead, the numbers are pretty low on the island. Absolutely. Yeah. Just kind of non existent anymore. Um, there's pockets of them here and there. Um, they're also pretty poorly monitored on the island. There's just, just not a lot of funding to kind of enumerate and. Yeah, and as all these famous steelhead rivers have sort of declined, yeah, there's just there's nobody's fishing them anymore. There's not a lot of people looking at them. Why? Why did salmon kind of get get the all the attention that they do, and steelhead kind of fall by the wayside? That's I think that's a political thing. I, I imagine it's just the economics of it, right? Like salmon and the salmon fishing industry has been a huge part of this province and the Northwest forever. So there's always been that economic sort of impetus to. Uh, conserve and get more fish um and in some places steelhead were, were a huge economic driver and still are in places like the olympic peninsula or this kind of smithers terrace region up north um the skeena and the, yeah the skeena zone exactly and you know that that was sort of one of the last great bastions for steelhead but even it's really struggling and they, they had the lowest returns on record last year since they've been keeping track from the 50s wow and that's been on a pretty steady decline the olympic peninsula has had all these massive closures um the island yeah people hold the island up as be careful this is what could happen to your steelhead if you're if you're not careful because they yeah they've wiped out there used to be a huge steelhead tourism guiding industry on the island and it's it's all but vanished and the thompson's the same that's another one that's we've almost completely lost one of the most like this world renowned steelhead run is is basically down to nothing and all, all those little towns along the thompson that used to support um, steelhead tourism are just kind of nothing anymore. And Do we know the reasons why those kind of fisheries collapsed? <sighs> it's it's a it's a bit of everything, and I, I think if you talk, everyone would sort of have a different idea. On the island, I think it was a lot of the logging because we saw the so habitat destruction. Yeah, because we saw the collapse happen quite quickly with the the destruction of um, freshwater habitat through logging. Um, uh, other places it's it's more complicated something like the olympic peninsula it's pristine watersheds for the most part um i haven't done enough reading to to really get into the the roots of those declines um we have challenges with commercial fisheries with river mount gill netting um they say that's a big issue in the skeena and, and fraser river stocks um which starts to it's also a complicated one um yeah, I think probably bycatch and commercial fisheries is an issue. Um, I think it's just the same thing. It's just all sorts of stuff. And it depends where you are and what systems, which one is the, the dominant factor. But I think it's a little bit of everything. And I mean, and still at angling, they used to catch and release is sort of near. They used to keep them all. So I, I imagine there was a lot of it was just reduction from angling harvest. Very, brought numbers down to a pretty low level and then all these habitat and all these other issues started to come into play and just sort of kind of the end of it <clears throat> and then more interior there's all the other issues because steelhead like aren't limited to just like the coastal kind of regions of cascadia like no. there's steelhead in idaho and montana like yeah totally yeah way but up then you're going the so much further and then there's there, there's issues of dams there's agricultural yeah. runoff there's like so many other yeah and factors exactly. that get calculated into it totally and yeah the columbia river system and yeah oregon washington stuff yeah certainly dams are, are, are a big part of it and the agriculture but yeah you're right like steelhead go far they i think they're the have the southernmost extent of any salmonid range like they used to be found as right as low as sacramento california and like, you don't really think of salmon as a california species but they, they were all the way down Maybe even some in Mexico, but don't quote me on that. But yeah, I do know they have the the southernmost range. And, um, but yeah, and those those Idaho runs are really cool. But, but yeah, the longer you're in the freshwater, the more you're exposed to all sorts of different issues. And, yeah. <clears throat> so Pacific salmon historically have been like as far south as California. Maybe even Mexico salmon. I'm not entirely sure. There are Pacific, like there's trout that are Oncorhynchus in Mexico and New Mexico. Right. Um, but I think, yeah, like the ones that we, to the five that we talk about, yeah, it's Northern California, and Central, I guess Central California. I Up through not. Oregon, Washington, BC, yeah, Alaska. into Alaska. And then of course there's Pacific salmon in Russia and Japan. And, and yeah. so historically, like those have been like animals that have been just hugely like massive populations swimming around the pacific ocean going to all these different rivers literally around like the northern uh, pacific rim yeah 
And what is this current situation or current status of these populations? Yeah. So like, <laughs> <laughs> are these populations, like in general, salmon have been in decline for a long time. And that, that's not... In the most uplifting uh, way yeah, possible. Yeah, that's not a Tell secret. Tell me about this situation. But it, it depends, right? Like, um, So the, the example that gets held up is the Bristol Bay sockeye in Alaska, which has had some of the their biggest returns ever in recent times. And that's... I don't know, like that's, you know, an amazing pristine watershed, um, really well managed fisheries, kind of doing things right. And, you know, maybe being more northern in their range, there's there's a lot of things that have worked in the favor of those fish. But yeah, here we are in 2022 and they're having record runs, whereas everybody else down south is sort of kind of scratching and, you know, things wax and wane and there's cycles and some populations do better than other, but on general it's in decline and but and the west coast of vancouver island has had some really drastic declines and that's sort of been the focus of attention at least on our end of things and um yeah particularly in chinook um but just in general yeah numbers are fractions of what they should be and have not been really showing any signs of rebound at least in our part of the world and like to get into the specifics like they're not just like in decline like oh like half are showing up it's like some rivers only see like 12 fish returning yeah. where like there used to be an uncountable number of fish coming back. Totally. Yeah. No, it's they like depends who you talk to, but some of these populations it's, it's down to less than 10% of their historic numbers that are, you know, just based on 60 years ago. Right. Which we know it's a fraction of what they used to be. Um, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's numbers of rivers here that the, the populations are so low. You start to, run into concerns about genetic diversity and it's are these runs even self-sustaining like salmon are quite uh, they can take a lot of harvest right like they sort of figure you can take half a run and it and that that can be sustainable but as but once it starts to get down to these really low numbers you know like their, their ability to kind of sustain their own population starts to come into concern and well, and when we <clears throat> live in a society that has glorified and like made this part of very much part of like the traditional way of Cascadian life out here, you know, mm -hmm. you go steelhead and you go salmon fishing. It's like a thing um, that everybody wants to do and wants to take their kids doing. It's mm -hmm. just people don't want to be told that they can't catch fish for one year or that they have to take less fish. How does that impact uh, regulations and kind of the direction that I don't know? government dfo like people in charge of managing these populations goes that's a tricky one like yeah of course like i think that's the, the most amazing part about salmon is how ingrained they are in our in our culture of course first nations and indigenous folks and and then as well as as, as settler and colonized british columbians like i you know i it's a big part of my identity and i know a lot of people feel that way as well and and salmon angling is part of that. And I understand the reluctance to take less. And especially when we've seen declines happen so quickly that a lot of people and like older salmon fishermen experienced um, huge numbers. And, and it's really hard to kind of rectify that, well, you know, not that long ago, I was seeing tons and tons of fish. And now you're telling me there's none. It's still within like living memory. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And we're, and we're, all, we're all sort of still used to that. Um, so I think, yeah, changing that sort of perspective, you know, I, I don't think there's anyone now involved in salmon in any way that would argue that they're increasing or, or doing really healthy. But it, it's, yeah, it does. Of course, that, that plays into government policy and like, you know, sure, we could shut down salmon fishing and see what happens and put a lot of people out of work. I don't know, disconnect people. Like, I don't know about that argument. You hear it in like hunting and fishing that like the people out there doing it are sort of your best first line of conservation because they are monitoring, they are in touch. Like, I wonder if we would sort of lose that connection. I don't know where I fall on that argument. Like sometimes I'm like, yeah. With fishing? How do you mean? Well, like fishing and hunting people, like they, they use it. Like we should keep these things open because we need people on the rivers. We need them out at sea. That's how people connect with fish and wildlife. And if we remove that, then the um, maybe the drive to protect things goes away. So like if there is no salmon fishing anymore and, and a new pipeline project wants to come in, now there isn't this voice, this kind of 
collected group of anglers who are worried about the impacts to their fish who are going to speak up against that and of course this pipeline is going to have impacts beyond just fisheries but without that sort of connection um, would there still be a voice like I, I know plenty of people who are not fishermen who are biologists and want, are into salmon conservation and that, that's where I sort of sometimes struggle with that argument but then I do really appreciate the the voice for conservation that a lot of anglers and, and hunters are um, so yeah, of course it, it, it gets messy and, and complicated when you start to talk about shutting things down and, and then people start pointing fingers, well, you're going to shut me down. Well, what about this issue over here? And what about this issue over here? And like, I mean, in general, of course, everyone should probably take less. And, and I think it's interesting because it's still, I feel like it's still primarily viewed as a resource and there's not still that, like that connection to caring, like for our whole lives growing up like we were always taught that fish don't have feelings they don't matter they're just like <laughs> expendable you can grab yeah. it you can beat it on the head chop its head off while it's still alive throw it in the freezer and that's just like what you do yeah um like and then there are a lot of people that would argue that fish absolutely do have feelings and that's like highly immoral but there's like, this like disconnect that we as humans have to fish like how do you get people to care about something that we can't relate to like in the last decade, like I feel like I've seen some of the biggest movements for protecting Chinook come from people identifying with uh, habitat for southern resident orcas. So it's like people are able to connect to this big, gi giant, charismatic megafauna because, you know, whales form uh, matrilineal families and they can communicate and they have little babies and like we can relate to them. But like when you see a little baby fish, you're not like, oh, cute. You're like, <laughs> I'm going to eat you next summer when you come back. You know? <laughs> Maybe, like... Yeah. And that, and that's a good point. And that's probably something that really has kind of got us in the situation with fish. Yeah. They were just been viewed as a food source. They're cold and slimy. And if you don't fish, you don't really have any interactions with them. Um, so, and yeah, and I, I think part of that is, I don't know, I guess just the marketing of salmon. Um, and I don't, I don't know how to get around that. They're always going to be cold and slimy. I, I mean, I think they're beautiful and <laughs> cute and like, and I think it's about getting people connected with them. I mean, like salmon viewing, I, you know, does change people and that, that's a certain way to kind of get people to connect without harvest, right? You take people who haven't seen salmon to go see a big run. It's pretty mind blowing. And and that piece um and then like like you saw when you're snorkeling yesterday being in the water with them does sort of change your perspective of what they oh, are and what it was they're doing magical absolutely magical yeah. like it's one of those things that like i've read my entire life like the life cycle of salmon and them coming back but when you see a little inch long fry <laughs> and you're like oh my god this thing is going to live the wildest life yeah. travel how many hundreds of thousands of kilometers down this river into the ocean around and come back you know going from an inch long to something that's like two feet long like it's, it's incredible it's amazing yeah and even just the fact that they can live in rivers these are not hospitable places no. it's cold and wet and there's not a lot of food and just yeah so I think that's a big part of it. Connecting, like most people only see salmon in a grocery store or maybe a bloody photo of someone holding one up on a boat or something like that. Yeah. Because they are elusive. But yeah, seeing them in the river, interacting with them, I think that's just it. Like whales are so much more approachable and, and it's, it's obvious how majestic they are. And, you know, like, yeah, I'd love to say, well, why can't we just conserve salmon for salmon's sake? Like they are worth it on their own. But whatever avenue you come to it, if the result is the same, like killer whales need protection too, and and if that and, and if salmon protection is is a spinoff of that, then great. Like I don't, I'm not too concerned about how people get there. But you're right about how do we kind of keep that up? I mean, make people be connected. And well, I mean, it's like you were kind of saying at the beginning. That was a really great way of putting it, where it's like it's a machine, and the like if you start pulling pieces, it might still kind of function, oh, yeah. like quote unquote and looking at it like it's going to do a lot of the same things but it's ultimately it's breaking down and it's like looking at salmon as like this this part in the machine of everything around us like um it's you know people don't need to be absolute scientists to understand the connection between salmon and bears and forests like that's a pretty well studied and documented thing yeah. these days um but then even going beyond that like the impact of um, you know, the forest to the greater kind of biosphere and the way that it, they regulate climate and everything mm -hmm. like those all come down to these fish that live in these waters. Yeah. And it, it, that's the whole thing. Right. And that's just like keystone species concept. Like, yeah, these fish have a really outsized role in the machine, too. Right. Like there's some parts you can pull out 
and things will kind of keep rolling like you're talking about your truck you can maybe take out the ac and that truck's gonna work for a while it's, it's not gonna be as great windows who needs yeah, windows pull up the windows yeah, yeah. but the, the salmon are almost the fuel or the pistons or something like real critical um you know and, and life will go on without salmon unfortunately and then i guess the other piece is like like that i like to talk about yeah so we have the ecological piece of salmon bringing marine drive nutrients back to the forests and helping these places grow and be as productive as they are um there's the economics of them coming back and us being able to capitalize on that and and the cultural bit feed like, our families yeah and then there's the cultural bit of just i couldn't imagine a bc where the rivers are they don't have salmon in them like even if i wasn't fishing anymore i wasn't working in salmon just as a British Columbian, like that would hurt. Like it's just it's it's just a part of the fabric for me at least. And um, well, and especially like the indigenous communities around here that like these are like literally the backbones of those communities. It's what they ate. Oh yeah, and, and that's a whole nother level of connection that we won't ever understand. But yeah, no, that's the reason these nations were able to develop such amazing art and culture and technologies. They had this amazing food source that was just going to keep coming and they could focus on other things other than harvest and just that you know that connection is is pretty special and when um jess and i were talking on the last episode she said this thing that has stuck with me like yeah. talking about um how <laughs> like back in the day um i think she was mentioning it was the toquat nation but okay. there was like population of ten thousand people and that blows my mind because Euclid is 2,000. Tofino is like 2,500, 3,000 people. Yeah. And like you look at the impact that Western colonizers have had on that landscape of like developing things and having houses and and at the same time, all this rampant resource extraction from the forests and the oceans that surround the area just to support that those slim numbers of people. Whereas like these indigenous <laughs> nations have had 10,000 people yeah. living here and you wouldn't know like the forest is just like as rich and vibrant as ever. It's like such a totally different... Oh yeah, a way of living. Yeah, absolutely, and yeah, <laughs> that's a huge. That's the thing. Like, I'm no anthropologist, but we do. Like, I think people like envision First Nations people as being these like tiny little groups, like just sort of subsistence living. But now this place was thriving with lots of communities and people up and down the coast and different camps and different nations and and yeah, and they were able to do it without destroying everything. And then we did it very quickly. And all linked together by these salmon. Yeah, yeah, supported by salmon and then the productivity that follows that. You know. So when it comes to solutions and stuff, um, hatcheries have been a big thing. I know you've have you you haven't worked in hatcheries. Yeah, have you been working with Thornton? I work with Thornton Creek. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about your thesis um, that you're working on. Yeah, so my thesis, um, my master's thesis here, we're working on through the University of British of uh, Northern British Columbia um, under Dr. Eduardo Martins and in partnership with the Toquat Nation and the Thornton Creek Salmon Enhancement Society. And so our project kind of stemmed from, from a few different things, from like it's me wanting to kind of pick up on some hard skills I feel as is lacking as a biologist um, and uh, yeah, use a few different sort of data collection equipment and techniques and, and things like that. And also sort of this interest in studying hatchery practices. And there's a lot of work going on right now to sort of evaluate and refine hatcheries because for so long it's sort of been used as this very like blunt instrument of, of salmon conservation and um we've sort of recognized that unfortunately it doesn't work as well as we had hoped um and so this project is about it's about kind of two things like i wanted to sort of from my work with redfish and get, get a bit of a handle on this sort of early life of west coast chinook and and their freshwater habitat or freshwater like utilization i guess um but then because our numbers are so low um to do any kind of study is almost impossible so we sort of defaulted to using hatchery fish um, which are not a perfect analog to wild fish um, of course and so we kind of partnered these things two things up to sort of use hatchery fish to evaluate um, the different release strategies of the hatchery. So they, you know, when they're releasing fish in the river, uh, every hatchery does it differently, but these guys were really kind of keen to um, try some different things. Um, like for example, this hatchery does stuff as simple as they've painted their holding takes brown. So they look a little bit more like a river. They put hemlock boughs in um, 
to in yeah to help sort of fish um orientate to cover and like sort of learn these things that they're missing so i guess to backpedal a bit sort of the big challenge we've been realizing with hatchery fish is hatcheries are amazing at getting eggs to survive um but in terms of getting fish to come back to the rivers we have not had much success you know the return rates are very low and then we've also sort of um beginning to realize that they large numbers of hatchery fish um can have serious impacts on wild fish and, and it comes down to like either competition physical competition for habitat and food like back to the ocean piece like we the studies that kind of figure there's more salmon biomass in the ocean at any given time than there ever has been because of like russian and japanese and korean hatchery production combined with alaskan and all especially in pink and chum sending out all these fish to feed in the ocean and there might not actually be enough food out there for them and then they come back to the rivers and yes there's competition for space and habitat but then there's also interbreeding and we do know that in hatchery rearing conditions you get epigenetic changes that reduce those fish's likelihood of survival whether it's they, they don't avoid predators they're bad at honing there's sort of a bunch of different theories of why what about being reared in a hatchery so for anyone who doesn't know a hatchery just takes fish from the wild collects their eggs and milk spawns them in the hatchery facility raises them until they are fry then releases them back into the river and um, kind of repeats the process and that that's hatchery production that's stock supplementation with hatcheries and we've generalized used, that's yeah and we've used that for 100 plus years and, and especially in canada in the mid 70s it really took over as one of our dominant tools for salmon kind of conservation and supplementation for fisheries today's unpaid ad spot for folks doing good things in the world goes to the thornton creek enhancement society at Thornton Creek, as Tom mentions later on in this episode, they're doing some really innovative stuff with hatchery fish in order to get them more adapted for life on the river. They also work with local schools creating all sorts of education programs where students are able to raise salmon fry from eggs and release them in local streams. You can learn more about what they do at thorntoncreekhatchery.com. And now, back to the pod chat. How did um, the salmon hatcheries become a thing in the 70s like you're talking about? What was the goal with them? How do they operate? mass scale like across the nation yeah like so all across turtle island basically <laughs> yeah. and i can only really speak to the the bc situation and like the the states it's it's there's a longer history of it um that i'm not so familiar with but in bc yeah it was the mid 70s and as far as i understand it was sort of a response to big declines in, in fisheries in, in salmon fisheries and a bunch of people trying to figure out what are our options to kind of rebound these stocks and, and keep fishing going and and hatcheries were sort of presented as that that was going to, going to be the direction and that was the it's called the salmon enhancement program it was founded by dfo so it's a federal initiative and they built um quite a few of these large um production hatcheries that are sort of focused on producing large amounts of fish for fishing um and then there's also these community hatcheries which is what thornton creek is or tofino hatchery is or and they're sort of designed around more supplementing populations and um with the concept there being yeah like do less fish higher quality fish more about trying to kind of keep stocks from collapsing while minimizing your genetic input not maybe not at the time they didn't know all this information but but these days um these smaller hatcheries yeah doing a lot of work to try and refine because their their goal is to conserve populations whereas the production ones are just trying to mostly make fish for fishing and, and keep the fishing industry going that's been like the primary goal yeah but, yeah. yeah that's that's the main goal and that, that's what hatchery fish are, are kind of good for like if, if you can get them before if every hatchery fish was caught before it got into the river you would start you'd at least eliminate that kind of competition and that interbreeding piece um where that's when they start to have the wild impacts you would still have those conflicts at sea to an extent but the, yeah so, so the basically idea, all they're good for is catching and eating yeah kind of <laughs> well just because yeah unfortunately they they don't return as well the second like and then yeah the mixing the second generation fish also don't do that well but there's there's quite a few systems in particular here on the west coast where like I'm not sure there'd be any fish if there wasn't for hatchery production and it's it's a fine line and especially once you go down the road of hatchery production it seems very hard to turn off the tap and i think we've sort of done a few of those experiments in clay quad where when the the hatchery production that does happen there gets stopped the numbers just drop 
and and I don't know if that is because of the imp the already the damage done to wild genetics or something else going on. But yeah, so we're sort of in this time here where we realize that hatcheries aren't this kind of golden solution, but I don't think the full scale like stoppage of them is sort of on the menu. Yeah. So back to my masters and, and Thornton Creek is really trying to work to how can we do better at our jobs, right? And and that to do so you need to track and monitor your returns. Like that hasn't really they haven't had the resources or the technology to do that. And so this year, or, and for my work, we put these things called pit tags in all their fry, where we did 5,000 of them. And a pit tag is a passive integrated transponder. It's a tiny little rice grained piece of technology that you can inject into a fish when it's very small. And the cool thing is they don't have a battery life. Um, so what happens when, when a fish with that tag swims by a, detection, a piece of detection equipment, that equipment can read the unique number off of that tag as the fish passes by. And, and the cool thing about that is that tag will laugh the life of that fish. So our experiment was playing with where in the watershed we release these fish. And then, so we did a couple different locations from a lake to a tributary way high up to right down near the ocean. And then we used some equipment in the river to monitor when those fish left and sort of, sort of gives us a handle on the survival during that freshwater period it was sort of, the um, kind of some of my questions how long did these hatchery chinooks stay in fresh water how does where they were released influence their survival um and yeah so kind of a simple experiment yeah release them in different places and we did a couple different releases through the sort of the natural release season um we looked at things like weights and lengths of each individual fish and how maybe that influences their survival um and then ultimately we will try and detect these fish coming home and get the sort of the full circle piece of it. But for my masters, it was really the freshwater component. Right. So when do you expect to see them start coming back? Uh, those will be like, yeah, two to five years more, more, I think more commonly for those fish, it's three. Um, so yeah, I think if we can scrape the funds together, we'll put the equipment back in the river starting this fall. And then this project is part of a bigger, um, project led by the BC Conservation Foundation and the Pacific Salmon Foundation called the Bottleneck Study. And they're doing this work on multiple rivers across the island to do just that. Use use this new technology, well, it's not new technology, but use it more widely in hatchery practices to try and get a handle on when and where fish are dying. And not necessarily just hatchery. Those guys are doing both wild and hatchery fish. And then so our piece is kind of the West Coast component to a lot of stuff going on on the East Coast of the island. But yeah, that's sort of... <laughs> a bunch of different information there. So you've collected all the data. Yeah. Um, you haven't synthesized it yet? You haven't written your thesis yet? No, that's in what I'm in the process. Yeah. So it's been three years of data collection. And now, yeah, I'm hoping to get all that stuff together and defend in the summer here. But... Sounds like some late nights coming your way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. New dad, full-time job, grad school all at once. Oh, yeah. When yeah. it rains, it pours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Lots let's, of free time. Let's backtrack a little bit. Tell me a little bit about um, the epigenetics of these hatchery fish and why... Um, like how that impacts the fish behavior and why it's dangerous when they breed with wild fish. Yeah, and that's something I only really have a loose handle on. I'm not a geneticist. But as, as way as I understand it, so epigenetic changes are, yeah, changes in the genetics of the fish or whatever it is as a result of sort of the environment and the environment that they're reared in and raised in. And then those, act, those changes can then be passed on through well, the parents, right? And, you know, and just like from a simplistic view, looking at it, right, um, those fish are reared in oftentimes very sterile conditions, right, where compared to a river, which is all, all sorts of stuff going on. There's predators, there's, uh, I don't know, there's cover, there's everything that comes with being in a river that there's has flooding been... Flooding events, there's you, yeah, there's debris. It, there's, exactly. There's just so much going on that obviously has some role in, in shaping a salmon's success um, that of course in the hatchery environment um, in the original sort of designs of it it was trying to remove all of that stuff so oftentimes it's plastic circular tanks they're reared in or it's some um, concrete raceways or, or metal cap troughs um, but these are very sterile very not river-like um, conditions and they, they don't have to worry about predators um, they always just hang out in huge densities together. And 
And there's something about that process that um, alters them enough that they they don't seem to do well in the wild. And I don't know if it's they don't know how to avoid predators. They don't know how to navigate as well. It's probably a whole suite of things. Um, but they, yeah, they know that the return rates of hatchery fish are typically very poor. And so they make up for that by just producing large numbers. Um, so like what you were saying previously, like hatchery fish, high rate of survival for eggs, but low rate of survival for fish once they're actually once they're born versus yeah. wild fish, it's low rate of survival for the eggs. But once they're born, theoretically, there's a higher survival rate. Yeah. In general, like salmon survival is, yeah, it's mortality is really high in the egg stage and it, it just slowly gets better um, through time. Whereas like, it sounds like in my understanding of the hatchery procedure, yeah, they can get almost perfect egg survival, egg to fry. But then once they're released, their survival does just kind of keep going down. And, and that's sort of a lot of this work is trying to figure out exactly where you know, so, so my work, we, we found out that, you know, it's rough numbers, but it might be as high as like 80% of those fish died in the river before they even left. 80% of the hatchery fish. Yeah. That's sort of what we were seeing in the wow. total work. Yeah. And some similar stuff on the couch and had similar numbers. Like, so yeah, big amount of mortality. And then, and then who knows what happens at sea. Um, yeah. I mean, and that's expensive. That's like, cause it's taxpayer funded. I don't know the exact numbers. I don't know if you do, but like <clears throat> I've seen places before where it's like $125 is like per fish that returns is what the taxpayer is spending. Some of those big, yeah, operations. It, it, yeah, it can be. For, yeah, if, you, if you're costing it out by amount of fish return versus right. money invested. Yeah. And it, it does start to make you think a little bit. Um, well, and then so what they're doing at Thornton Creek then painting the painting it brown they have hemlock branches in it that's kind of like in an effort to naturalize the fish or get them used to what river life is like exactly just trying like little simple things to try and boost that and that that's sort of developed by this guy rob brower at the knitnat hatchery who's kind of been a leader in sort of progressing hatchery practices um and yeah, and even just things, yeah, switching to a brown straight raceway instead of a circular tank. Like they they found that even having to swim in a circle, they they develop strange growths on their otoliths on one side. Like oh, there's just like yeah. just too many. You know, there's not too many animals we raise in captivity and then release in the wild. Let alone migratory animals as complicated as salmon. And yeah, and the otoliths are bones in their ears. That it's like balance, right? Yeah, um, I think these, all sorts of features, but they're commonly used to assess age and yeah, and uh, freshwater residency, saltwater residency. But yeah, so they're, if they're they're swimming in a bones. circle, the like ear on the inside track is going to get. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can't remember which one grew Weird. or not. That, that yeah. was recent work from a UVic student there. I was just reading. Um, but yeah, there's just a, there's just a lot of issues with raising something like a wild fish totally. in a, a sterile. It's raising yeah. anything in captivity like yeah. that. Like, yeah, well, I don't understand the details of the genetics, but you almost just intuitively realize that like, this, there's a lot of, the, we're skipping a big part of the process. And then the other part is like, especially here, a lot of the fish aren't even, re they're not reared on the water that they're going to be released in. So Th Thornton Creek, like I was saying, is on a manufactured run and that's where they get their water. But then those fish are dumped in the Toquat River. And yes, that's where their parents came from. But, um, they, yeah, they have, they've been acclimatizing to a whole different set of water conditions, right? And, you know, we, we know how important, like, yeah, exposure to their natal water is to honing and coming back. Um, yeah, so it's just a whole suite of things that just kind of make hatchery fish a little um, inferior, and um, <laughs> unfortunately. And, yeah, and then the mixing with wild stocks, then it's just like, yeah, if you could keep the two separate, it wouldn't really be an issue. But then, though, like we were talking about earlier with the, the genetic diversity of salmon and is what's made them so successful. Because that's the other piece with hatcheries. They're only catching a handful of fish and doing as many crosses as you can. But you're still getting a lot of fish out of a couple pairs versus the wild where, you, where there's a lot more intermingling going on and, and mate selection, right? You cut out the mate selection piece with hatchery. You just grab two fish and breed them together and... Like I've seen videos of salmon spawning and it doesn't really look like there is much mate selection going on. It's just kind of like whoever, like biggest, strongest male that can get there and yeah. do the deed fastest. <laughs> there's, yeah, like looking at it, sure. But I think there's certainly lots going on, right? That they, they do choose. I don't, I don't understand the details of that too much, but there is, there's a lot more going on than it looks like. And then, 
uh, yeah, there's all sorts of interesting things with salmon pairing and spawning. And, um, but there's just more to it than we get and we give them credit for. And, but like, yeah, some people are like vehemently anti-hatchery and that's the problem. And just like all these things, right? Like there's a lot going on and some things are worse than others. And I, yeah, I don't know if hatchery is the, yeah, the main cause of decline. Um, but just like all this stuff too, we just have to be a bit more careful with how we use it, right? Like had, we just sort of jumped full, both feet in with this hatchery thing and just sort of committed to it without really understanding the impacts and the long-term impacts. And I, I think we're starting to catching up on that. But like I, I like to view all these different conservation options as just like tools and how you wield them is sort of up to you. And we can get, we can be refined about it or we can be really blunt about it. And something as complicated as salmon, I think we do need to refine our, our techniques and we need to know as much as we can before we start. Like restoration can have negative impacts on salmon, absolutely, if it's done poorly. And you, mm -hmm. like, and, you know, same with fishing closure. Like this, yeah, you just need to understand what you're doing. And I think hatchery sort of just went full steam ahead it may without understanding all the comp complicated relationships and, and consequences that this could have and we've but, got to learn to tread lightly yeah and and understand what we're doing and 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 then be willing to change and adapt when the things we thought we knew turn out to be wrong like that's it like all this stuff is good intentions like i don't think the people who came up with hatcheries or, or currently run hatcheries they care about salmon more than anyone right um it's all good intentions, but it's just understanding and refining. We learn more and more every year and we have to be willing to change our minds and, and adapt to like, I think is, is a, it's like sort of, we're talking today about where humans are pretty good at like, once we go down a road, we have a hard time sort of switching gears and, and making big changes. Yeah. Um, I mean, and it's like, at some point, like no matter how hard you're trying to push that square peg through a round hole, it's just not gonna go. No, but we like to keep pushing. Right. <laughs> Especially when there's big money invested in creating machines that help push that yeah, square peg exactly, the and that like sunk cost and, thing. Like, yeah. we really, like, well, we've done it. We've gone this far. We've made this peg. Yeah, we, we got to use it. Yeah, <laughs> and then not only that, but then like you get people who are like, my daddy worked on that peg. I'm gonna work on that peg. Like yeah, it's, it's it's this it's like, my right hereditary thing. That, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, people and get that's, tied that's to just, it. Like, basic human stuff. And you can't fault people for it, but it is. Yeah, we seem to be pretty reluctant to make big changes. Mm. But yeah, no, the hatchery piece is, is super interesting. It's not black and white. Mm. So in your opinion, like, what do you think we can be doing from a hatchery side of things, doing it differently to refine that and make it work better? Well, that's what I'm trying to still figure out. Like, <laughs> it, it seems to be like less quantity of fish, more quality, but figuring out how to make what is a quality fish is sort of challenging but we can do things like like what dave's doing with the um, yeah altering the rearing conditions um have they had much like have they been able to monitor and see if that's making an improvement not yet it's all yeah. pretty fresh for them um but then yeah some people are doing really careful genetic selection where they'll capture their fish they'll take genetics they will determine if this is a good match and then breed them um we can do things like take a bigger variety of eggs and do more crosses um yeah like, this stuff isn't really my <laughs> i'm just kind of armchairing it but like <laughs> that's fine that's what i'm doing here yeah <laughs> there's there's a lot of people who devote their lives to this and i'm sure have really good answers based on your experience whether or not you're like an expert at it like you're still entitled to an opinion and you know more than the average person so <laughs> yeah, i guess and yeah and so like yeah working on okay and then like releasing trying to figure out what size is a healthy size of fish to release what's not too big not too small um or how we treat them too like there's some people on the the side that well we should use them for fishing and that's it and we can do things like terminal fisheries where we wait for all the salmon to come back we we have marked all our hatchery fish we collect those ones we take those out we eat them we use them for maybe brood stock or maybe take the wild ones for brood stock that's that's probably what we should do but eat all the hatchery fish satisfy your need for food fish um and then remove that out of the system let your wild fish go unmolested and and hopefully at the so so now you're you're um supporting a fishery a terminal fishery in your community at the river mouth where you live 
You're still using it for a food source, which yeah. is its primary and purpose in the beginning. Yeah, while you're letting your wild stocks do their thing, yeah, without being fished, without having to worry about breeding with wild fish. But are all aren't all hatchery fish marked anyway? No, no. It really depends on the system and the hatchery and um, I thought yeah. they legally all had to be marked. No, no. At the big hatcheries, they seem to mark a good chunk of them, but the little ones, no. And there's the sort of two schools of thought on that, too, because, like, marking is usually, yeah, it's, it's so you can understand your returns. Or there's a lot of places where you have a mark selected fishery where you can only keep the fish with a mark. And so a hatchery that's trying to do um, population enhancement doesn't want their fish being caught up in one of those fisheries. If it's got its fin, it might in certain fishing areas, it might be allowed to go. Um, but that's sort of the argument. If you think that wild hatchery fish should be allowed to spawn, you would you would kind of lean that way. Um, but no, yeah, because mass marking is expensive and takes a lot of time. And I, I think that is the way forward. And it does seem to be that's shifting. And there's more and more marking and tagging at all scales of hatcheries, at least in BC. And I hope that does just become the norm. And, and then we can like, that's yeah, get a handle on our numbers and really f figure out what's going on. Cause, cause that, that is another big issue with the hatchery thing is it sort of masks the true state of our populations when there's a lot of fish swimming around and it's hard to tell, right? What if wild fish conservation is our goal, it sort of gets muddled up by like, there's a lot of hatchery fish out there. And um, I'm wondering, so like a terminal, terminal fishery so basically the fish that are made in that hatchery sorry terminal hatchery the fish that are created in that hatchery are released into the rivers they grow they go down to the ocean then on their way back to that river they're caught and kept out of the wild population so you let the wild population go up the river yeah that's kind of like the end goal so yeah like, that, that's definitely yeah. one approach to it and, and i know they're over on the sarita they're they're moving towards a model like that um, in Alaska, they have something similar called like salmon ranching, where it's sort of the same idea. That's a bit more on like a production scale, like depends on your river, but terminal fisheries are typically more like feed the community sort of, sort of thing where it's like, and that's what that would accomplish. Like you would still be getting all of the fish that like we as a culture of humans rely on and would want. Maybe they're not obtained the same way. Yeah. Like, you'd still have ocean fishing. River fishing would be a completely different thing, at least mm -hmm. until theoretically until populations rebound. But um, yeah, I I'm just trying to think like, would there be any negatives to that system of like juvenile wild fish in the river and then getting inundated with all sorts of competition from hatchery fish at a uh, pretty young stage in their life? Yeah. And that's a good question. Typically they like, yes, they are concerned about that, but a lot of the times they attempt to stagger hatchery releases once the wild fish have left the system. Gotcha. So in here on the Toquat we do, yeah, the wild fish are sort of out by end of May and that's when the hatchery releases start into June. Gotcha. And that's that idea. Yeah, avoid that. There is some literature out there to show that they might actually just meet up in the estuary and then have those issues again. But the whole, yeah, try and give the wild fish a head start. And then it is like, it's a lot of hand. Like you have to capture all those fish. So all the fish returning do get caught up. But a lot of uh, monitoring too. It yeah, it's like. a lot of yeah. work, right? It, at, and and someone has to be there fishing and keeping those wild fish out. Right? <laughs> it's funny because it's like one of those things where it's like, oh yeah, this would work if we just like invested more quality time into it. Just like so many systems that yeah. we create. But then it's like, you know more jobs more time yeah, more spreading it out. all that, of a sudden that takes down the bottom line and you're not making as much money well it spreads the money around which i think is great because like the normal commercial fishing model just got to be like bigger and bigger boats with more nets and like and it's just like consolidating it right when we can go out at sea and catch tons of fish instead of like a little mosquito fleet fishing close to home and as these things expanded yeah the money gets consolidated to less and less people who take more and more um and i do think yeah salmon is a great opportunity we could spread that out and we could have small community fisheries rather than big mixed stock offshore mass factory fishing right? yeah so you're investing in your communities and the ecosystem and and your fish right and that like that bristol bay example i was talking about like that's just a huge salmon and salmon fishing culture up there i mean those fish feed all of us but people are very attached to the, their watersheds. And there's that recent, well, not recent, long running pebble mine issue. And I'm sure you've heard of that, which is huge public outcry. I'm, I'm aware of it. 
For anybody that's not, what is it? That might be a better one for you to explain. But the Pebble Mine is <laughs> a nasty Canadian mine being proposed or has been proposed for a long time. In basically, the headwaters. In the headwaters of all these major Bristol Bay watersheds. And it's, and it's gone in and out of legal stuff. And I, I, yeah, it seems to get off the shelf, on the shelf. Well, and that's one of those things where it's like you can do all the environmental assessments you want and you can say this is the risk. This is what we calculate. We're going to do this mine better than we've done mines in the yeah. past. Like, sure. But like if something happens and it and it threatens all of that, is it worth it? Yeah, absolutely not at all. Right. Like, that's... I don't know the numbers, but like the recreation industry and fishing, like the fishing industry, like those communities, like billions of dollars compared to how ever many millions or maybe billions that yeah. this mine will generate but it's like yeah. is it gonna does it outweigh the stakeholders who live on these rivers and depend on these exactly. fish exactly no and the, and the and the long term loss of that right like oh, some of right. these last great watersheds for salmon and we we can't come up with anything else but to put a mine in it's just it's just gross that that even be proposed like I don't even really consider myself an activist or environmentalist, but like that, just it's just so egregious that someone would even propose that, um, and and then that it gets entertained. But I mean, I, that's Canadian mining, man. I was part of that. It's it's a wild world, and then the cross border thing starts is it gets really interesting, right? The salmon between Canada and Alaska, and yeah, managing that, right? Like Canadian company wanting to mine in Canada when the impacts would be on Alaskan fish and. Yeah, and balancing that starts to get real political. Well, I mean, and like all these conversations, like it's so much more complicated than just having a simple discussion about it. Like there's so many nuances to it. Like we were just talking about habitat and, and hatcheries basically here, but mm -hmm. then there's all sorts of other different impacts. And like, and tell me about the connection between um, the fish that kind of come from British Columbia waters that end up making their way up into Alaska and are fished up in Alaska. I know that's like a contentious issue that like a lot of people in BC are like pretty upset about because like Alaska is known for having these great fishing numbers. And, but when a lot of those fish are coming from BC waters and then they're now not making it home, that impacts our rivers. Oh, yeah. well, that's a huge thing in all salmon management and salmon treaties. Where are you on the line? Right? Like, Alaska benefits, you know, of course they have their own amazing salmon producing watersheds, but they're also every fish that came out of the Columbia or came out of the west coast of the island or the Fraser River is probably rearing somewhere, whether it's the Bering Sea or southeast Alaska. Um, and then they start their journey home when they're out of size, they're mature and ready to be caught. And so those guys kind of get the first, uh, first crack at it, right? And it's it's tough to balance, right? I, you know, that, that's a big fisheries management question. And, and only, yeah, there was that recent study that showed that Alaskans might be taking more than they're allotted. But we do have a, a Pacific Salmon Treaty that is supposed to mitigate this. It's supposed to balance out this sort of thing. But kind of easier said than done. And I, I don't know the details of how all that works. But, yeah, and it's the same with it, and where you are in the river, right? Like a guy downstream gets first crack and how do we manage for the guy upstream especially when we're fighting over like the last few i just yeah that's just it on a bigger scale um yeah i don't know how I, like more marking frick i don't know what you would do to to balance that do you um do you consider yourself an optimist <laughs> <laughs> i think so i think if you maybe some people you know, i know wouldn't describe me that way and it depends on the day uh, <laughs> i think that's everybody though yeah <laughs> like yeah some days i'm more optimistic than others for sure and i don't know i think like i'm optimistic in the fact that i'm not going to stop trying to do stuff like i think you can sort of that like Oh, it's all for it's all lost anyways. What's the point of caring? Is like a really negative attitude. I think you can be pessimistic about the future because it sort of like shows a understanding of the the severity of the situation when we're talking about salmon or climate change or one of these kind of any issues of the day that yeah. <laughs> it's a black cloud on any kind of positive thought. Um, so I think yeah, there's got to be some optimism to keep going and keep trying. Um, 
But uh, yeah, no, I guess I'm all fine. I don't know. It's a fine line between like <laughs> pessimism and realism these days, I feel like. It is, yeah. And like I don't things know. are pretty daunting. Yeah. And I mean, I like to stay optimistic because it's like I can see where things have the potential to get better. It's just a matter of um yeah, I guess and it can feel like an up, fighting an uphill battle, like changing the things that need to change in order for those positive changes to occur. Yeah, and I think that's a good approach to it. And like, I think just like blind optimism that everything's going to be okay is kind of like part of the problem and how we got here. Humans are sort of good at that. Like, right, even this climate change stuff, I like, go, oh, we'll probably be fine, right? Like, that's just an easy attitude to have. And then you don't have to do anything. Yeah. Um, if you're pessimistic enough that oh, I don't think things are going to be fine, we should do something about it. I think that's probably an okay position because it is serious. It Constructive is, it pessimism. Is, yeah. If you get so pessimistic and nihilistic that you're just like, screw it uh, there's no point and in my dark moments i have those thoughts why am i wasting my time doing this i'm just gonna go fishing <laughs> but you're you're a new dad yeah yeah that changes things for sure right how is having mac around and like ha he hasn't gone fishing yet has he oh yeah yeah has well he... not himself but he's yeah, tagged yeah, along right. yeah has he held a rod has he <laughs> felt the tug <laughs> not quite the he tug has, is the drug man he has not felt the tug yet but he'll get there no he's been out on salmon boats he's been steelheading I took him up to the Bulkley this fall. He was, yeah, we were fishing from the chest pack. He was two months old. Does having a kid give you um, more motivation or a different outlook on things? Or <laughs> Yeah, and again, it's that sort of balance. Like There's like this mo new motivation that I want him to have the same appreciation and love of fish and nature that I do and get to experience it in the way I do. Um, there's a lot of even like the talk of having kids and i used to be on this sort of fence of like well i bring a kid into this world it's so messed up and right i find myself on that side of the <laughs> and, fence and, it's quite and it's certainly a valid view and yeah and i don't know maybe it's selfish to have kids right now or maybe that's not what the world needs for the same token yeah it's yeah so i would like my son to to grow up in a world with healthy ecosystems and plentiful fish and wildlife and i'll keep trying to contribute to that um yeah, it it does change because there's sort of it's easy to get into an attitude of well I'll just get mine while I'm here and like if you don't have an, another generation and and that's you know that's fine too um, but now I feel like I do I do owe a bit more you know I wish we all thought like that right we're supposed to be thinking about the next generation but we're we're not good at that when it's not attached but now when it's my son Mac and I picture his future like I. I don't want it to be Mad Max apocalyptic <laughs> world or yeah. whatever. I like. I'd love for him to be able to go salmon fishing. Maybe he can be a fish scientist, or at least just have a, a nice place to grow up. Um, yeah, my favorite kind of apocalyptic scenario. Yeah. I, I'm a zombie movie kind of guy. Zombies. I feel like if the world was going to end, I'd rather be via zombies than like Mad Max or Waterworld. Like, <laughs> zombies just seem like more fun. More scary. I like the Mad Max fashion, though. Like I, right. I could see the leather and the spike outfits. <laughs> and he'd look good. Yeah. I mean, if you're into that, uh, by all means. In the Thunderdome. But, yeah. No, it, it changes things for sure, having kids. and Well, it's funny because uh, so many people on the other side of that have kids. And then they use that almost to justify their actions of, like, doing things that... Um, do kind of destroy these systems in a way like in chasing this kind of like economic return that you need to live the quote-unquote american dream and to like provide that high quality life for your kid um versus like people who ha take having a kid and like use that to like okay i'm gonna do more environmental restoration work i'm gonna like tread lightly i'm gonna lessen my footprint and do more conscious thinking on like these these issues yeah absolutely and and that is, it's a tricky approach too. And like, uh, and some of that, also the ability to think about those things comes from a place of privilege. Right. Whereas like, you know, like my family is relatively financially comfortable and um, I, yeah, can afford to make those sort of choices um, to do with less. But, you know, raising a family is expensive and, and like it does sort of shift your mindset of you do your first and foremost priority is now taking care of this living thing right. and providing for it. And I, yeah, it's, 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 it, I don't judge anyone for that. Like I think it is easy to start to think that way you do or everyone just wants to do the best for their kid. And yeah. And for some people that does mean yeah, having a bigger house and a bigger car and 
I mean, it kind of comes down to these like primal instincts of like, what do I, I got to do what I got to do to take care of mine. A little bit. A, yeah, exactly. But like so much of it can be so easily short sighted where it's like, mm. yeah, you did that in the time to like give your kid a quality life for the next 20 years. But yeah. if in creating that life, you like ended up ruining the next 60, 80, 100 years of their life. Like, is, does yeah, it balance out? Does it balance out? Yeah. And that's a tough one. And, and anyway, it, it is hard to live beyond the moment when you just, you got a, a hungry kid or you, know, you just kind of see what you got to do. And even like, I thought, oh, we're not going to have plastic toys at my house. Like, we'll be able to get around <laughs> that. And then like, sure enough, my house is filled with this plastic crap. <laughs> like, it's just like part of it. Like, it's just like, because these are the things that like entertain a young child's mind and and they are the av available and accessible toys and yeah it's it's funny the things you compromise and feel guilt about and yeah let's try and do my best here <laughs> yeah i think we're all just out here trying to do our best but yeah no absolutely it, it changes things do you see anything happening in the world of fish and restoration and this kind of like all these habitat issues do you see things that give you like little rays of hope i do absolutely um yeah and like you know it's so easy to get caught up in the negativity and the, this is the status quo thing but like i do think i find solace in the how resilient salmon are and there, there seems to be you know it's it's been 10 years for me now working in salmon which is kind of relatively short to a lot of people's careers um but just the, I've seen a lot of change in the mindsets around habitat restoration, around things like hatchery practices, around dam removals. Like, I, you know, humans don't seem to want to act until things are in full crisis, uh, which is sort of where we're at. And, I, you know, there's been a lot of like, the, the amount of funding, for example, I've seen redfish get has grown and grown every year. Um, as there's more and more interest in this kind of work and recognition that it's important. And with that, I see, yeah more interest in pushing the field of restoration forward and more interesting cooler projects happening um, that are well funded and 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 hopefully having some positive impacts and there are lots of cool success stories around salmon recovery in in small scales right but i think just like the death by a thousand cuts thing too we can probably fix it by a lot of little victories like right i feel like a lot of people are searching for the you know the panacea like this golden solution but and I find if we kind of all just kind of keep, keep chipping away at it, the timelines are, are tricky, right? Like salmon are declining quite quick. We're sort of learning how to like recover and help. I yeah. don't know if it's too late, but um, hopefully not. <clears throat> well, and then there's interesting things when you get into like the policy and politics of it when it's like, um, like fish farms are a huge factor in, in wild salmon returns, mm -hmm. especially like juvenile survival rates. But you know, when, um, the ministry is looking at extending leases on fish farms for another five years. Those are some critical five years that we have. Like even if like, okay, five years and then that's it. Then no more, then we're out. It's like those, yeah. that could be the make or break type of years. Kind of. Yeah. And that, that's sort of the situation we're in and talking about like, yeah, it's like crisis mode of do we have that kind of time, you know, to talk about slow transitions and, and change things. Yeah. And that part gets frustrating with the government and policy because nothing happens quick. But then, yeah, it's just tough. You got a fish farm system. There's a lot of policy. There's a lot of jobs. There's a lot of people's livelihoods that are wrapped up in that. Shutting it down overnight. That's, that's a tough thing to do. That would hurt a lot of people. Um, do you want to talk about fish farms at all? Do you want to explain to people? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's, it's, not, it's really not my world. Um, I know it's a touchy <laughs> subject, too. There's... Yeah, it's just a, like so fish farms, open net fish farms aquaculture is rearing salmon in pens in the ocean out here on the west coast for food exclusively for, for food. food yes they they have their own hatcheries they produce um, and out here on the west coast it's typically their atlantic salmon that they're yeah reared in nets pumped full of food and grown to market size and then and then taken and eaten um um which you know sounds like a good system for taking some pressure off of wild stocks um but unfortunately, being where they are, placed um, in the ocean, typically on migration routes, they've had all these sort of negative impacts on wild fish in terms of disease and, and pathogens and things like sea lice. And it, it comes from rearing large amounts of animals in really close quarters, right? That's how disease breeds. It happens in everything. And then they have, you know, lots of efforts to try and keep those things down. Um, 
but they're sort of limited in their success. And then, of course, wild fish come across these pens on their migrations, and there's been plenty of science to show that they don't do well. Once they encounter it, they either get disease, they get sea lice. Um, there's all sorts of kind of issues that, that plague wild fish when they come into contact with um, fish farms. I mean, I think there's been enough science to show that they are bad for wild salmon. But on the flip side, they are a big economic driver in small coastal communities. Um, you know, and we are also on the other side of it's, it's got to remember these, these coastal towns used to thrive off of fishing and logging and that's gone, right? Commercial fishing is a fraction of what it used to be. It's, um, same with logging, like, yes, it still goes on, but it's nowhere near the supporting these communities. And when we live, you clue, it was a major fishing logging town and that kept that made a lot of people's livelihoods, right? And getting rid of that is really painful for people. Um, and yeah, I, I'm not trying to support fish farms. It's just trying to acknowledge the, the, uh, that it's complicated. And it is, and you know, for remote First Nations, it can be a major source of jobs and ec economic development when they aren't given a lot of other opportunities. It, it, but if it comes at the cost of wild fish, that like for me, that's too much of a cost to bear. But I do recognize the challenges with um, removing them. And I also, you know, there's plenty of places without fish farms where we have massive salmon declines too. Like, you know, it's, it's, it would be a lovely thing to get rid of them. I, I am in full support of that while understanding the challenges that come across, across with that. Um, but I, is, is it going to reverse things overnight? Probably not. And, and yeah, no, that's, that's a really tough and complicated one here on the coast. And I, I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like the Bristol Bay issue in a nutshell. It's like you have this thing where it's like you could make a big economic impact in the short term creating a product in an industry in this area, yeah. but it threatens the livelihoods of so many other people and not just like the livelihoods economically, but like the long term cultural connections to these lands and the ecological functions of these ecosystems. So yeah. it's like, yeah, I mean, and I don't know. I, I hear what you're saying. Like it is complicated for sure. Especially when you get big foreign investments coming in. Yeah. Um, but like, I don't know, you have to be able to draw the line somewhere. And like science is kind of like the universal language in that like we can see what's working and what's not working. So again, why are we trying to push a square peg through a round hole when yeah. we have so much science showing that <laughs> showing how bad it is for these wild salmon populations? No, absolutely. And that's the thing with a lot of these environmental issues. Like we're going to have to take some economic pain to kind of right some of these wrongs and, and get things back on track. And like the economic argument sort of falls apart when you think like the economics of wild salmon, the, the timing with the fish farms is just works because fishing had already d collapsed. If we had super healthy fish populations, there would still be a lot of people making their livelihoods off commercial fishing and sport guiding. I mean, sport guiding is still a huge industry in that. Um, but yeah, when it's, it's hard, it's, it's more, tricky to quantify the economics of wild fish, but they're, it's huge. And, and that's the thing. I don't think we can, we should threaten it in any way to supplement another industry. And, and, you know, right. um, and yeah, and that's the thing, like the economics of wild fish, like back to steelhead, there has been some studies. Well, yes, they don't have a massive commercial fishery at sea, but some of these catch and release fisheries, the amount of money, like somewhere like Smithers to like dollars infused into the economy for fishes, fish caught, is massive and I, I can't remember the number but they have done some cool breakdowns of that and it's like thousands of dollars because people will fly there and they'll buy tackle they'll stay in a hotel they'll go to restaurants they'll pay a guide to go up in the river and they'll they'll go and so, something like steal it catch a couple in a day you don't even kill them and and then you've invested a huge amount of money into that little community um versus just a massive industrial fish boat off at sea just whaling on salmon and right and it kind of seems like that's the model that ultimately like we're trying to kind of change in so many different elements here is that like that big commercial conglomerate model just doesn't work across this wide variety of of towns of ecosystems of all these different niches and nuances that you yeah. have across the landscape and the bioregion it's like you can't just like have a fix all solution or have a fix all industry that that handles it in a perfect way no. and it's like the economic thing yeah obviously you want it to be like economically viable but and i don't know the numbers for um 
for uh, fish farms or for hatcheries or even that, but like they're government subsidized industries. Yeah. And like even logging, like logging in BC is subsidized 365 million annually just in BC. And people are like, oh, we can't do this because if we change the system, we're going to lose all these economic jobs. It's like these, this, the economy of this isn't functioning as it should realistically anyway like we're already it's, it's already it's fake, subsidized yeah. by the government so what if we just took that government money and helped support all these people during a transition to a truly economically and ecologically sustainable uh, you know industry yeah no absolutely and that that's the thing yeah the fish farm thing too right they, their industry is subsidized by being able to use our oceans and wild migration routes as their rearing grounds for their fish and that makes for an incredibly profitable industry and they 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 keep saying, oh, we, we can't afford to put it on land. So it's like, well, we can't afford to do it without yeah. you know, using British Columbia's coastal waters to yeah supplement our farming practices. Um, it's all this unaccount- unaccounted for costs. Yeah, exactly. But then it, like, I think this comes back to the solution and all this sort of stuff is the small scale local management model, right? Like the thing with the factory salmon boat. That works for the few, right? One, some groups are making a ton of money off of that super efficient fishery, but it's not like in the day when the West Coast here would be full of small salmon trawlers feeding their families, feeding the community, making a good living. Um, yeah, and that's just become spire stars. Back to the terminal fishery or like community hatcheries, like taking the control back to the communities and less of this large-scale commercialization of everything i think would go a long way on a lot of these issues yeah you know um just wanted me to ask you about the toquat watershed restoration plan and the fisheries liaison are you Uh, yeah so that's just so i've been working with toquat nation started off doing habitat work with them in like maybe 2014 and then just in the last two years i've just sort of come on as um It's a really small um, nation and their lands and resources team didn't have a fish person. Um, And so, but there's not necessarily a need for a full time one. So I've sort of taken off, taken on this sort of part time role whenever they have sort of salmon and fisheries issues come up. um, I sort of just support them in that, um, which is a really fun role just because I spent so much time with that community and in their territory and on their rivers and and just being able to kind of support that from a a higher level. And then, yeah, one of the plans we're working on right now is that Toquat Nation is heavily interested in salmon rebuilding and conservation and restoration. Um, But there hasn't been a lot of work done just understanding their watersheds. Um, So we kind of got some funding together to start working towards a plan of this is what we're going to do in the main salmon bearing watersheds um, and Toquat territory. Um, and right now, it's just, just kind of in its early stages of identifying what's been done in terms of assessment and monitoring, if there was any restoration, um, what are current numbers like, and then sort of just laying out the next steps to get towards um, a watershed plan. We're not quite sure how it's going to pan out of. It's going to be like maybe a, a bigger document talking about the, the future of land use in this watershed, what we're going to do in terms of restoration, how we're going to do salmon enhancement, how we're going to do forestry, how we're going to do recreation. Um, but right now it's just starting and sort of just getting a handle um, on habitat conditions in, in, in all the Toquat watersheds. And then, yeah, that's sort of where we're at with that nation. And cool. Yeah. And there, so the Toquat nation is one of the smallest, it might be the smallest self-governing nation in BC and the, recently treated with the Malnuth Treaty and just like a, a really cool progressive nation sort of looking to get a handle on their lands and, and sort of make some you know, progressive decisions about yeah. what to do and where to go next. And and yeah, that's just kind of you know, part of my role of work here. And, I guess kind of in closing, because we've been chatting for a while now, um, why do you think it's important for people to become engaged, involved in these issues that they care about um, and why do you think it's important to see, um, you know, supporting <coughs> supporting nations like the Toquat and, and doing these kind of like watershed assessments? And you've already kind of talked about it quite a bit, but I think just like coming back to that local level. Yeah. And I, I think that's just it. Like you know, we talk a lot about uh, facilitating stewardship and getting people connected. And on the West Coast, it's less of an issue like still like you know these places we've been going this week like they're hard to get to people don't necessarily connect or, or can't connect on their own or they 
I guess, yeah, I think we owe it to where we live to understand, especially like since we destroyed all these places, like we went through and logged them all. It's sort of up to us as a community to figure out. The royal we. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't you or I, but no, you know. No, yeah. but I am benefiting from it, I'm sure, and directly, indirectly. Um, Bought your, your land from warehouse. I did, yeah, <laughs> exactly. My house is on an old tree farm lot. But, yeah, so I think there's val- I, th- I think we owe it to just understanding the systems around us and understanding what we've done the, in the consequences of our actions, right? And and then yeah, and like it's it's where we live. It's so easy to separate yourself, especially if you're an urban person. Like the wilderness is sort of the wilderness, and your town is the town, and they're separate, but like this, they're not. And the, we we live here. We these watersheds do provide fish that we could eat. And in theory, if we were better about this like local stuff, we would be um, benefiting even more from, from these places being healthy and um, managed properly. And, you know, in, in the case of the Tokwa Nation, yeah, it's just, it's understanding where they're at, what are our conditions here. We can't, we know there's been hundred years of industrial development and, yeah, where are we at and what can we do going forward? And then and then the other part about connecting people, like I think, yeah, just if you if it's out of sight, it's out of mind. If you don't know, if you don't care, um, these things just sort of right. go away without really knowing. And that's yeah, that argument I was talking about with the hunting and fishermen, like if there weren't people out on the rivers fishing, we would never know if there was lots of fish or no fish or if the caribou were doing well or not. Like you know, yes, there's government surveys and stuff, but yeah, people should care about where they live and the animals and the wildlife and all that that live there too. And yeah, I think that was a <laughs> rambly answer. No, but... that makes sense though. I like it. I'll take it. Okay. Um, final question. Do you have any fun facts about fish? Fun facts? Like what's though? the first thing that comes to mind? Favorite fun fact about fish? Oh, it's on the spot. Uh, I can't think of anything. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I sent you this question. I know. Fun fact about what's fun about them? Like when you think about a fish, like or like a steelhead, for example, like what's your, just your favorite fun fact? Uh, well, I, I don't know. Many, too many people know that fish um, can change their coloration depending on their habitat to help with camouflage. Like I'm sure you saw that in the Tokwa or the Tranko the other day. Some of those coho are brown and dark if they're up in the wood, or some of them are shiny and silver if they're out over the rocks. And yeah, color color changing is pretty cool. I mean, and even salmon when you catch a salmon in the ocean, it's more silvery and blue, mm-hmm. like an ocean fish. Yeah. Versus when they're you know spawning, they're like coming up, they're like brown and dark reds. They're yeah. like mottled. And it's camouflage, right? Like in the ocean, it pays to be dark on top for something looking down, and and shiny underneath to be something looking up. And then, but that doesn't fly in the river like if you, if you see salmon earlier in the migration they stick out like a sore thumb they're like glowing bright silver and then they start to take on those earth tones and more mottled colors to uh, this camo it's how does cool. that work do they like lose scales and grow new colored scales or does it like uh yeah <laughs> that's a physiology question i think <laughs> there's these cells called chromatophores it's the same thing that like the squid and stuff have that can actually change oh. their colors like as they're coming upstream yeah they are rotting and falling apart on because they're just dying um but yeah I, I believe and again this is out of my realm but it is these chromatophores that can change the color of the fish actively. Wild. and then like trout in a river will change like it's not even just at the end of the migration ocean to uh, fresh water. It's like within a river. Well, not like doing sampling, we used to use white buckets, but it's like you'd catch a, a brown fish out of a river, you put it in the white bucket and it would go bright again. And then you put it back in the river and you could just, it was just glowing again. So like, uh, like we should, we should use dark buckets and keep them dark. Oh, you know? interesting. Like, so that, that it, fast, it'll happen yeah, it in kind of real that time. Fast. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, I would notice that just doing the swim, like you'd go under... Yeah, like the shallower, lighter pools, they were like lighter, almost yellowish fish yeah. versus like in the dark, deeper water, they'd be darker, like in the kind of shallows and under root wads and yeah, stuff. Yeah, totally. And yeah, the, the degree in which they change, I think, changes through the, the, the fish's life. Cool. Yeah. So that's enough a, for you? That's a pretty solid fun <laughs> fact. Right. Then, huh? <laughs> I should have prepared on that one. More. Sure there's all sorts of stuff. All I right. think my definition of fun might be not the same. I, the check's out. I like it. <laughs> cool, dude. Thanks for joining me on this. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ross. Totally.
So big thanks to Tom again for coming in and chatting with me on this podcast. I know you were a little bit anxious about what to, what we're going to be talking about, but you absolutely crushed it, said some great things, um, and hopefully inspired all of you who have listened and tuned into this. Um, so if you want to learn more about Redfish Restoration Society and the work being done to restore these damaged watersheds for healthy salmon habitat, you can learn more at redfish.org. That's R-E-D-D-F-I-S-H.org. And again, if you're enjoying these podcasts or those fun, goofy educational videos you're seeing all over TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, wherever, you can help support their production by becoming a Patreon supporter at patreon.com slash nerdyaboutnature. Or if Patreon just isn't the thing for you, you're not feeling it for whatever reason, I've got some merch available at nerdyaboutnature.com. Or you can help support this podcast, this whole project by you know rating up the podcast here, liking, sharing, spreading the videos around, and getting more people informed and engaged. Because ultimately, the more people are engaged and aware of the world around us, the world that we all share, the more we'll all be able to work together to create a better future for us all. So thanks to every one of you who's tuned into this episode. And I hope to catch you in a couple weeks here with some more engaging conversation. Take care. <laughs>